So if you've been clamoring for a violent, blood-soaked post-apocalyptic shooter, well, I've got good news for you because Rage 2 is finally here. Developed by Avalanche Studios alongside id Software, it's a sequel to the 2010 game that about only 12 people seem to play, and even less seem to like it. The World of Rage is at least an interesting one. Set in the future after Earth was hit by an asteroid, society fell apart and bandits, mutants and a faction called the Authority all fought for dominance in their own way, with the rest of humanity just trying to stay out of the firing line. Rage 2 follows on with this setting, with the player being able to choose from either a male or a female character named Walker, who was aligned with the Rangers. Now, the Rangers serve this role as protectors for the common man, and they're just trying to maintain a sense of law and order. Of course, that all goes pear-shaped in the opening of the game as their base is attacked by the Authority, led by General Cross, who looks like a Quake 2 enemy. And Walker is sent out into the wasteland to initiate something called Project Dagger to stop him. I don't know how, but we gotta stop him. This involves working with returning characters John Marshall, Dr. Kavassier, and Lucem Hager, who was famous in the first game for having one of the most toned midriffs I've ever seen. God damn it. And that's pretty much the story in a nutshell. Cross shows up in the intro, acts like an asshole, then you only see him a couple of times for the entire game, the second time being for the final boss fight. Now, whereas in a lot of similar open world games like the Far Cry series, usually what happens is you're sent off in the world with a main storyline, with all of the side stuff being a bit of a welcome distraction. However, in Rage 2, all of that side stuff is the main part of the game. Project Dag is all about bringing together these three different factions to help take on the authority, but before you can do that, you have to do a certain amount of side tasks for each character. Like taking over areas held by hostile groups, destroying mutant nests, taking out convoys, or collecting bounties. The game world split up between different zones comprised of deserts, sand dunes, forests, wetlands, taking on gangs called the Goons, the River Hogs, and the Shrouded. Kind of sounds like the Australian Outback. Schwacked. Once you do a couple of these, you level that character standing up, you get a few upgrade points to spend on their specific skill tree, then you just keep doing that until you reach a high enough level that they give you a story-related mission. Once you've done this for all three characters, you can then proceed to the final mission and beat the game. It does kind of suck in the sense that it lacks a more refined and structured single-player campaign, and there's never really any sense of urgency to completing any of these main story missions. But that's not the problem. The problem with Rage 2 is that it has a really slow start, and it's a while before things start getting interesting. From the get-go, you're hit with about 30 minutes of solid exposition, and you just have to kind of sit there and take it all in. I almost felt like I needed to write this stuff down because of just how much information the game was throwing at me. The whole thing opens with this weird cinematic that if I'm being completely honest, feels kind of sloppy and rushed. As quick as a character is introduced, he's then killed off, and you unceremoniously take the ranger armor off his mangled corpse and put it on. Apparently the armor is what gives the rangers their superpowers, and gives you the ability to become a total badass. But you don't have many of these abilities from the beginning, in fact you've got none. Now these powers aren't groundbreaking, but they are still pretty fun. So you've got Shatter, which is like a one-handed Hadouken that can just obliterate enemies. Then you've got Slam, where Walker leaps in the air, then slams into the ground below. Next, you've got Vortex, which sucks all nearby enemies and items in before exploding and launching them into the sky. Then finally, you've got Barrier, which brings up a temporary shield to protect you from damage, which I think is probably the weakest ability in the game. Only because you really need to be standing still to make the best use out of it, and standing still in this game is like signing your own death warrant. Less offensive powers are Dash, which is used to avoid attacks and break out of a stun. And then you've got Rush, which is like a souped up sprint mode. Also, when you're killed, you can be revived with a defibrillator, but this thing has a cooldown of like 4 minutes, so probably won't get used all that much. On top of that, Walker can hulk out and go into overdrive mode, where the screen turns into an indie music video, and you do extra damage and heal super fast. You turn into a bit of a meat grinder at this point, and you can just shred through enemies. You can even upgrade this mode to extend its duration, and also reduce the cooldowns for all of your abilities. Like, it's pretty damn cool. The only downside to this, I think, is that the screen effects can bring on an epileptic fit, and after playing for a couple of hours, I even started to get a headache from it. And there's no way to turn off those screen effects, as far as I could tell. All in all, though, I think these are fun to use, and once you get the hang of the keyboard shortcuts, which are kind of finicky at first, you'll kick all kinds of mutated ass. Now, the way you get these is by finding arcs that are scattered across the map, but the catch is that only a few arcs are going to show up on the map initially. 
Then after that, you've got to buy Intel to give away their locations, or you can see them off in the distance if you hold down the focus button when you're out in the world. Even then though, you don't know what an arc is going to contain, like it could be a new ability, but it could also be a new weapon. And my issue is that without all of these abilities, the game just plays like a standard first person shooter. I mean, yeah, it's got some funky guns, but again, you probably won't have the best ones until you've spent a fair bit of time hunting down all of these arc locations. I almost feel like you should have started with all of these abilities from the get-go. Maybe the arcs could have contained the resources to upgrade the powers instead of the powers themselves. What this means is that one person's experience playing this game is going to be so different to someone else's. You almost have to prioritize finding these arcs before you do anything else. And you can't even complete some of the side tasks in the game without seriously handicapping yourself. I get that they want the player to explore and find all this stuff on their own. I just think it's seriously going to damper the reactions and early impressions that some people are going to get when they play it. And it's a damn shame because once you've got all of these abilities and these weapons, the game just becomes fucking awesome. Once you manage your cooldowns and use your weapons effectively, the combat just becomes incredibly satisfying. Upgrading everything is actually kind of confusing, so I'll do my best to explain it. So you're always on the lookout for Feltrite, right? And you use Feltrite to unlock new weapon upgrade tiers, but then you also have to use a weapon core mod to unlock the next skill. But you also use Feltrite to upgrade your Nanotrite abilities, using Nanotrite boosters to unlock incremental improvements. Then on top of that, you've also got those project points which go into Walker's base upgrades. And there's four separate categories with 64 of these in total. Not to mention upgrading your car by using auto points. And on top of the rest of that, you can collect everything you come across to craft grenades, wing sticks and infusions. Rage 2 actually does a really good job of trying to include a bunch of different weapons. And there's actual alternate fire modes for most of these too, instead of right clicking, just aiming down the sights. So I mean the assault rifle and the pistol are probably the most basic guns, like there's not that much new here. The pistol fires in burst mode if fired from the hip, but that's about it. The shotgun can be used in the traditional sense, which is fine and it works a treat, but the alt fire actually launches enemies backwards, which is handy for knocking them off ledges if you're high up. Next there's the rocket launcher, which can either fire a single shot, or you can lock onto multiple targets at once, and this thing makes short work of some of the tougher enemies. Now, the Pulse Cannon is an elegant weapon for a more civilized age. This thing just fires out bursts of energy with the catch being that it overheats the more you fire it, with the benefit being that it does extra damage the more heat it accumulates. The good thing is you don't have to reload, you've just got to keep an eye on its heat levels. The Firestorm Revolver is a gun with incendiary bullets which Walker ignites by clicking his fingers, which it sounds cool but it's a little bit underpowered, only because it seems to take a lot of ignited shots just to kill a basic enemy. Same with the Hyper Cannon, which is the game's version of a railgun. You can aim down the sights to charge it up for more damage, but it still feels kind of weak. I think a railgun should always be an instant kill in FPS games, especially against weaker trash mob type enemies. But in Rage 2, you'll see these inbred pond scum somehow shrugging off a direct shot to the chest, which is horse shit. Probably the coolest gun in the game is the grab dart. And what you do with this thing is you shoot someone a bunch of times, then you use the alt fire on a nearby surface, and it kind of snaps them to that surface super fast, often turning them into tomato paste at the same time. And I can't think of any other shooting game that has a weapon like this. It's awesome. And of course, if you shelled out for the Deluxe Edition or whatever they're calling it, you get the BFG from Doom, which is awesome, but it's just so overpowered to the point that I didn't even really use it all that much because it just felt like cheating. Thankfully too, there's no weapon limit, so you can carry all of these guns at once, along with your grenades and wing sticks. Oh yeah, the wing sticks, they're back. There's always something great about throwing out a homing boomerang at someone and just watching it make their head explode. You can even now control the trajectory on these things and send them to multiple targets. Yeah, think about that too. A homing boomerang that makes someone's head explode like it's every Australian's wet dream alongside drowning in a lake of fosters. During combat, there's plenty of things you can use for cover, and enemies aren't all that mobile, so flanking them or rushing their position gives the player lots of ways to take them down. You can even kick a grenade back into someone's face if you time it right. 
What's also good is that you're almost always the one who initiates combat. So you can approach any area from any vantage point you want with any weapon and choose how to kick things off. There's kill markers to help you keep track of who's dead and the color of your crosshair changes to let you know if you're hitting armor instead of doing actual damage. And there's a decent mix of enemy types. You've got different kind of bandits and mutants, not to mention the authority, who all have their own lineup of assholes that try to kill you. These guys are pretty intelligent too. Like at one point I saw one of these guys do a little dodge roll to avoid an incoming rocket, all without losing momentum either. Like the animation for that actually impressed me. Thing is though, I think you really need to play the game on hard mode to get the best out of it. And pretty much the only times I died was to those authority sentries, which are these giant dildo tower things that can pretty much one shot you and they can wipe out your entire health bar in a single hit, which isn't fun. But aside from that, it felt balanced, and I never felt like death was cheap or unfair. The game also uses a fixed health system, so your health regenerates to a point, but you're still going to need to use a healing item to top it up, so you've got to be mindful of that when going into combat. I only found out after a couple of hours of playing that you can also upgrade your health points and damage output, making it even easier. Now, I'm not trying to shame people for playing on normal or easy mode, but I do think you're missing out on the intensity and the urgency of the combat if you're playing on a difficulty mode that doesn't give the enemies at least some semblance of a threat. I mean, you are fighting inbred, mentally challenged bandits that think that launching a grenade at you with a baseball bat is a more effective means than simply throwing it. But that doesn't mean these guys should be a complete pushover. Sadly though, I do have to say that the combat can often be inconsistent. The game plays really well during the more interior or cramped locations like the towns and settlements, where you can just take on a bunch of guys at point blank range and go nuts. The issue I think is that in a lot of the more opened up areas, enemies quite often don't rush you. Instead, they're happy to hang back and shoot at you from a distance. And I can't even emphasize how frustrating that is, when you have to stop what you're doing, run off and chase down that one guy who wouldn't come to you. It's just a total killjoy and it removes the whole flow of the combat. I mean, you're here setting up combos and watching your cooldowns, but then you've got to stop and run 200 meters away to find that one guy who's hiding in a tower. That puts a pretty huge buzzkill on the power fantasy of being this post-apocalyptic combination of the Doom Slayer and Iron Man. Then there's the return of the races from Rage 1, which was honestly the worst part of that game. Though this time you only need to do one of these to get through the main storyline, then you never have to do it again. Thank God. Scritch scratch, we got your John H and we good to go. <laughs> Vehicle combat's a bit more developed than the previous game too, which is where the Avalanche Studios Mad Max thing comes into play. So the way this works is that aside from bullying smaller cars you come across in the wasteland, you can also take on these larger convoys as well. Once you're brave enough to take these guys on, you start at the back of the convoy and work your way to the front, with each vehicle getting tougher as you move forward then it's just a matter of exposing the weak points on the main rig and blowing it up. Now, I really disliked this part of the game in their preview builds, mostly because the controls were just dog shit. But on the plus side, it does seem like they've now refined the controls, at least for some of the vehicles anyway. I mean, the motorbike handles like you're driving across an ice skating rink. And it's still common for your car to spin out sometimes when you're chasing convoys because you drove over a rock the size of a tennis ball. And although the weapons will lock onto other vehicles, you've got no real control over what weak points they lock onto for the main rig. The only one that took me a bit of effort to beat was one of the tougher ones where for some reason my car didn't lock onto the turret on the back of the truck that was shooting at me. Instead, it preferred to lock onto something that wasn't currently tearing my car to shreds. I mean, you think the thing that is actively damaging me would take precedence. Even then though, there's no real danger to these because whenever your car is destroyed, you only need to hop out and use your focus power to repair it. So there's no real threat of dying or having to redo any of these. I'm back, Walker, and feeling good. It's a bit weird too that the upgrades for the car is just so basic. You can't choose the cosmetics or even play around that much with different components or parts. I mean, more options to customize the vehicles would have been a godsend. Outside of these convoys, there's no real reason to use the car anyway. Early on in the game, you unlock this hoverbike thingy called the Icarus, and once you get it, you'll probably never get in your car again, at least not for traversing the map. Using the Icarus combined with fast traveling to the major settlements is just a much easier way of getting around, which is a bit of a shame because once the car's upgraded, it feels like you're driving around in the goddamn Batmobile, a Batmobile with a sexy voice that talks to you. Systems activating. On PC, the game ran really well with practically no stuttering or frame rate drops, and generally it looks really good. It's just the overall image quality I think looks a little bit blurred. It's one of those games where the anti-aliasing just seems to smear the edges of everything. 
I have seen some errors though, like I've had times where there's no sound effects or sound effects missing. Music might often stop playing entirely and I have to quit to the main menu and load back in to fix it. I've had entire missions softlock, I've had NPCs that refuse to talk to me, and most of the boss fights seem to be a variation of just one or two enemies, just used over and over. What I think is that they spent most of their time and effort refining the combat, and as a result, these other factors and mechanics kinda fell to the wayside. But I mean, when push comes to shove, I don't really have any issues recommending Raids 2. When the combat is good, it's really good. And like I said in a previous video, shooting and killing shit has just never felt so fun. when you go on a tear on an unsuspecting group of bad guys and just obliterate the lot of them, or ground slam half a dozen mutants at once, it's really satisfying. So if all you wanted to do was play this game for its loud, crunching combat, then you're not going to be disappointed. As long as you don't mind waiting a little bit at the start for it to get to that point. Raids 2 I think is a great sequel to the first game, even if it is a different kettle of fish. The campaign alone took me about 16 hours to get through, and even then, I still had a huge map full of markers and icons for me to complete. So I'd say check it out, just make sure to have the Aspirin on standby because you're gonna need it. And as far as Australian Outback simulators go, I'd say this is one of the better ones.